All right. <coughs> so my uh, name is Alex, and uh, I've been a member of CS. Uh, I think it was together with Scott I started in uh, 2011 or 12. I don't remember exactly. And uh, initially, I was working on uh, live stream as well. Uh, but uh, over time, I started got involved in uh, this uh, real-time video transmission. And there's a very good reason for that. <coughs> um, as you've seen on uh, MyLink's video, we had several onboard cameras uh, on Nexu. And I think it, there was one of them which was recording uh, on flash and uh, three other cameras that were streaming live to mission control and the live stream. And uh, camera one was uh, placed in the lower end of the rocket and the end of this external cable canal. It was looking down, providing us a rear view of the rocket and what was beneath it. Camera two was placed in the upper end in the parachute section, mounted on the side of the rocket, looking out towards the horizon, uh, as long as the rocket was vertical, at least. <laughs> and uh, finally, camera three was also in the parachute compartment, uh, looking up. Uh, during the ascent, it was showing this visual heartbeat, which you may have seen, uh, to keep it going and show us that it was alive, and then it showed the parachute deployment and uh, yeah, the nice flight down. Now I'm going to spend a few uh, minutes on uh, the technical part of how we actually sent this video down to the ground station. Uh, because uh, when people asked me or started talking about doing this uh, digital video downlink, I kind of knew exactly what we had to do. And people were surprised, but that's because I initially worked on this design in 2008 already. Uh, but the design was sitting in my drawer because back then it was the Google Lunar X Prize, which didn't really work out and the technology was still in its infancy. So I was a little happy to take it out and see if we could implement it today. And 10 years later, yeah, we succeeded. Basically, what we did was uh, implement a system called DVBS2. It's uh, what satellite television is based on. And uh, the reason for that, why it's good, is uh, the DVBS2 standard is a technical specification for how to send, uh, how to make a one-way transmission of digital audio and video data over a satellite link. And if you think about it for a moment, that's exactly what we need. We don't have a satellite, but we have a flying object where we want to send audio and video from. Just one way, no network connection, no interaction. Just send the video and forget about it. And the other reason why uh, using such or making a design based on this standard today is that it's a technology that's oriented towards con consumers. So there's a lot of equipment that we can go out and buy and use our, in our setups. Um, basically, uh, the complete receiver chain was bought off the shelf and we could focus our efforts on uh, designing and building the transmitter parts which should which uh, was integrated in the rocket. And uh, this uh, slide shows a functional diagram of the transmitter itself that was on Nexu. Uh, we have, uh, starting from the left, we have the three cameras which uh, capture high definition video. It was just 1280 times 720, not full HD. And they, uh, they encode the video into a compressed video stream so that we only have about <laughs> 3.8 megabits per second per camera. The compressed video is sent over to a main computer over a USB network connection. So the cameras basically act as network cameras. Uh, the main computer multiplexes the three uh, camera streams into one transport stream. A transport stream, again, is a standard uh, data stream used widely in the broadcast industry. So again, very standard technology uh, that was readily available. And uh, in addition uh, to that, the transport stream is then used to create a DVBS2 signal in the digital domain. So we do a lot of digital signal processing on, our, on the main computer. Uh, after that, what we need is a, is a transmitter device, which takes the digital signal and transforms it into radio frequency. That's basically a digital to analog converter and an RF up converter. And out of that, we have a 1.3 gigahertz um, signal 
which we amplify to a certain level and transmit down to Earth. On uh, these two pictures, you can see two of the cameras. Oh, by the way, uh, there's a lot of software involved in this process, and all of it, except some firmware, firmware in the cameras, is open source, either available already or written by us and is available on GitHub for future reference and for others to use. Yeah. So we, had the, we have these two pictures of two of the cameras. These are actually camera two and three that were up in the parachute compartment. As you may recognize, they are Raspberry Pi Zeros with their corresponding camera module. And uh, the reason we chose uh, those be it was because they are small, they are cheap, they cost four euros per piece, I think. And uh, the camera is a little more expensive, but they are really good at taking pictures, encoding video, and sending it out, uh, over to something else that can post-process it. So really does exactly what we need, and we don't have to worry about many other things. Uh, camera 2 on uh, the right side is, uses, is a, a standard camera module. The one we used for the parachute, well, looking up, was, uh, um, was a clone camera or a compatible camera, but it had a wide-angle lens to give us a wide uh, field of view. On uh, this picture, you can see the uh, actual transmitter box that was in Nexo 2. Uh, on the left side, we have the main computer I mentioned. It looks like a Raspberry Pi, but it is not. It has the same form factor, but it is in fact, uh, it has an Intel processor. Uh, we need quite a lot of computing power for doing the digital signal processing. And uh, then in the middle, we have the transmitter device, which was the digital to analog converter and the RF uh, up converter. It's again an off-the-shelf transceiver board, which we kind of customized by removing connectors and uh, boded a lot of soldering <laughs> on it to make it flight ready. And finally, uh, on the other end, we have a power amplifier built by uh, Peter Mortensen, which was uh, originally based on a kit, right, but then modified to, be, to work better for our purpose. And of course, a custom milled uh, enclosure, uh, which I think uh, took a lot of time to do. I <laughs> think Spent quite a few evenings, but it, it uh, worked out pretty well. And uh, this is the, uh, the transmitter mounted in the parachute uh, section. You can see where it was. Uh, you can also see uh, camera three uh, mounted there. And camera two is uh, up on the top below the, or behind the blue uh, tape. That was the one looking uh, out to the side towards the horizon. Um, now, if you take a look at uh, the Nexo 2 rocket, you can notice that blue section, uh, which uh, Scott al already mentioned, was the video transmitter antenna. This was, in fact, a new antenna we have uh, tested together with the transmitter. Because up until now, we were using these, uh, yeah, some people call them horn antennas, but they are, uh, in fact, uh, whip antennas or monopoles. Uh, the black. Uh, horn-like things are just some protective enclosure. Inside there is a, a small wire cut to a specific frequency. It's this, but by the same concept as the antennas you have on your Wi-Fi router at home. And uh, those antennas are good because they are easy to manufacture and easy to tune to a specific frequency, but they are, have their downsides. They are impractical because as the number of antennas grow, we'll, we'll have more and more things coming out of the rocket, and people who handle the rocket don't like it. Uh, and the other thing is that, uh, as it <coughs> turns out, they are, they are not very efficient either. So that's why we uh, started looking at uh, uh, flat antennas that can be mounted on the surface on the rocket, which you can see on the lower end of the picture. Uh, Basically, they are patch antennas, and in this configuration, we have four patch antennas phased together to form a single antenna. And uh, the concept is similar that you will find on uh, uh, Wi-Fi antennas, these flat panel antennas. The difference here is that it's wrapped around a metallic cylinder, which, of course, influences their, uh, 
uh, the way they work. So we, there has had been done a lot of simulations and design work by a colleague uh, of us, ours, Morten Hainsen. And uh, maybe you've already seen there were two blog posts last year, one by, with Peter who explained the uh, antenna designs in, uh, in a video uh, blog. And uh, the second by Morten Hainsen who did the, the design work and the simulations and uh, he wrote a technical blog about all this process. So I can strongly recommend you go back and uh, <coughs> look it up if you're interested. Uh, on these two uh, pictures you can see the, the radiation pattern of the two antenna configurations. On the, on the z-axis vertically that's aligned with the rocket. So. On the left side we have, uh, I think it's six monopole antennas uh, mounted around the rocket and what we can see is that uh, that configuration will radiate most of the power up and down uh, and not so much to the sides. Um, that's okay as long as the ground station stays uh, below the rocket but sometimes things get out of control as we know or we have seen. So therefore the patch array, which uh, has a much more isotropic uh, radiation pattern, is uh, much more preferred. And uh, uh, beca because then we are not uh, limited to, to, we have more freedom to place the ground station wherever we want. And also if the rocket starts spinning or rotating, it's still fine. Uh, on this picture you can see the final uh, antenna. Um, uh, it's about, so it's basically some copper uh, material mounted on the dielectric uh, material mounted on the rocket itself. And the blue thing uh, you saw was, uh, uh, was basically just some shrink wrap to protect it. And I think the blue color was because that was the only one we could find in that size. So if any of you know about some orange or white uh, shrink wrap of, well, okay, I guess it has to be very big now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll find another solution. Right? So, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, we have uh, tested uh, cameras, we have tested uh, video electronics, uh, radio electronics, and the new antenna design. I mean, what could possibly go wrong on a maiden flight for all this? Uh, uh, I, I was hoping for maybe a few minutes of video uh, during ascent and see the parachute, but. Uh, as it uh, turned out, we had uh, video practically during the whole flight, uh, starting from liftoff until it hit the water. There were a few dropouts, uh, but uh, I don't know, maybe you already seen this video that uh, Thomas put together the day after we got back, which sh shows the, the whole flight from the three cameras. It's, I can strongly recommend you go in and watch it uh, uh, over and over again. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite fun to watch. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have also the raw footage, but uh, it's basically the same. <coughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we, we were pretty satisfied uh, with the result. Uh, also have some uh, quantitative uh, uh, data, not much. We logged a lot of data, uh, including uh, uh, power measurements on the receiver and the signal to noise ratio. But uh, since we were using uh, a consumer grade equipment the numbers are for some reason uh, have arbitrary units that I just <coughs> cannot figure out um, so that's why the only one I took uh, was the bit error rate and the received packet rate what you can see here is uh, I included the uh, the altitude of, of the rocket uh, uh, during the flight to be able to correlate uh, the events with the data and uh, again, the bit error rate also comes from this uh, receiver and it's a number between 0 and 65,535. I have no idea what it is. Is it actual bit errors? Is it some percentage? Is it what? But uh, at least we know that when it's 0, we have no errors. When it's non-zero, <laughs> we have some errors. And probably a higher number means more errors than a lower number. So uh, what's important to keep in mind is that uh, we have some forward error correction on the transmission, so there is quite a lot of errors we can tolerate. And we have two layers of error correction. One is corrects for bit errors and one corrects for packet errors. So uh, I don't know where the limit is, but uh, if we look at the other graph, which is the received packet rate, which 
as far as I know, was something uh, Scott measured, so it didn't come from the equipment, but something we logged, because it looks actually very reasonable. As, as you can see, it's practically a constant line with some noise, of course, and the value of 8,000 packets per second uh, corresponds re very well to the 12.1 megabits per second, uh, or 12 megabits per second, give or take, that we were actually transmitting. And we can see that the large drops uh, here is probably when we reach apogee and the rocket starts to turn around and the large drop is, I would expect that's the, the drogue deployment when a lot of things happen. And then the next one this is uh, when the parachute is deployed and the other ones are probably due to some spinning. So that actually looks very well. So uh, yeah, from my point of view, the conclusion is clear. We uh, have a quite uh, good design and uh, it's modular, it's flexible, we can scale it up. Uh, I didn't do the exact math, but Peter was telling me that he would prefer not uh, going above uh, 10 megahertz RF bandwidth, but I think that will still be enough to get more than 50 megabits per second of data uh, from uh, suborbital flight. So uh, yeah, that's it for, from me. Thank you.